So I kind of said, well, I'll do anything you want me to do. What do I have to do? And I did everything. and jumped through every fire hoop. And I learned what it was all about. So I became a state licensed nursery. I then proceeded to do what I always had done at some points. But I went to the World's Fair, as most of you may be in here, or many of you have not, in 1984. And I bought my first two plumeria stems from the Hawaiian Pavilion. I didn't have no clue what they were, so he grow me to have fun. Some little hula hoop girl was dancing, and I bought it. I think they were two for five dollars back then for a step, maybe even cheaper. So I found out I had a pink and I had a yellow. I grew those for about the next 10 years until the internet came along sometime in early 93, I think I joined the internet and became a guru. I was in DOS back in the day. And I learned a few things about Plumeria. I realized that there was a Plumeria Society of America. I had no clue what the hell that meant. So I kind of joined that society eventually and kind of became one of the posh people and tried to learn a little bit more about Plumeria. I learned that Plumeria come in all sizes and shapes. They come in tree form. Some trees grow in the Hawaiian area or the tropical areas up to about 60 feet. And they grow just about as wide, 40 feet wide. So these trees are huge. And what they are used for is, funny thing is, when they were discovered, they discovered that perfumes could be made with these. So they started using these flowers and different aromatic smells and so forth, that they could make perfumes that were outrageous. And still to this day, many plumeria are used for perfumes. So they harvested the flowers by the Brazilians. And there are acres and acres and acres of farms of just certain varieties of trees. And they are used every day. There's a place in Hawaii called Jim Little Nurseries. And then there's another place called Jungle Jacks. And these are two of the biggest propagators of plumeria in the world. Now, other places such as Thailand, such as India, and uh, what's the other area I'm thinking of? And I forgot. Okay. I'll move on. I'll stop. These places are now starting to grow crazier and crazier plants that are well sought after by the general populace. I am a plumeria nurturer, so I want everything that is unusual, rare, fantastic, new, different color. I'm into all the new leaves now. I'm into gray leaf plumerias. I'm into yellow leaf plumerias. I'm into uh, chartreuse leaf plumeria, variegation plumeria leaves. And this is something that has really just started being propagated within the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. So by the time it hits the market, of course, the first plants that arrive here to the United States cost you an arm and a leg. I sell some variegated plumerias right now for about $95, which is outrageous. But my import fees, my import taxations, everything that I have to do to get these plants, they cost dollars. So you, Saints just had a touchdown, by the way. I <laughs> don't notify me, so it must be 8, 12, new, we are up okay with it. Congratulations, Saints, to be here. Make a long story short, when you get a plumeric and you grow it here in the South, People are so afraid to grow. They continually call me. They continually write me. They continually message me. I have a friend here today that's running a booth for me, with me, and her name is Karen Bellotta. She is a guru of the American world. I'm sort of a guru. I'm really young to her. She always says she started in the ice ages. I say, well, no, I thought volcanoes were still there. She, um, she taught me a few things I didn't know. I've taught her a lot of things I didn't know. I like selling, she likes selling. But we don't want to really sell to make money. And if you think I'm in the business to make money, you got another thought coming. Because let me tell you something, a home-based nurse, as big as I am, you don't make money. You invest it back into your wares, into your materials, into your plants. And she'll tell you the same thing. If you go out there after this is over, say, hey, how much money do you make selling from various? She'll laugh at you. You can make money. 
but you have to have acres of farm or a gigantic area to really make money. So, going back to all these different leaves and all these different flowers, all these different perfumes, all these different smells, I'm going to get into the propagation end of it right now for you. So, a plumeria here to grow, it will produce new plants. How does it produce new plants? You can take 12 inch stem cuttings of a plant. And if you have any, I suggest that if you ever have to cut them, you invest in one of these guys. This is a PVC plastic cutter. It is the smoothest cutting thing for cutting plants. I use them for plumeria. They're in the dogbane family. Dogbane family, what the hell is that? Vinca, periwinkle, um, yeah. uh, man, I'm lost on the train of thought of that one now. But anything with a white, sappy solid substance in the middle is in the dog bang family. Some of it is, is very poisonous. Oleander is another one, very poisonous. But to cut these things, these sappy centers, and have a straight cut, I suggest using one of these cutters. <coughs> anything else really does a raggedy, jaggedy cut. Why am I saying all about that? After you make that cut, you need to take the bottom of that plant and immediately put it into a rooting hormone. And the rooting hormone that I've found over all my years to use is called Homodin 3. It is a very good, active, it's very active. It has the most active ingredients pretty much any um, rooting hormone. It is great to use. It seals off the bottom of the plant. The plant will leak fluids for at least five to 15 minutes. After that, you make sure you have the home in it on it. So what are we gonna do with the cut part that's cut? Oh, no, I haven't gonna throw that away because we don't need it anymore, right? No. We're gonna get some cinnamon out. We score the extra <laughs> <or> something. <laughs> Thank you, anyway. So you take cinnamon. And if you've ever known anything about, like the Egyptians use cinnamon to ward off bacteria, funguses, and so forth. So on that cut stem, we gotta stop it from bleeding, we gotta stop it from having an infection. Cinnamon, boom, done, over with. You don't cover it, you don't touch either one of these. Leave them alone. The top stem is cut, she's gonna rest, and she's gonna callus with the rooting hormone for 10 days. If you plant it in the soil earlier, you're really taking a risk of losing that plant or that cutter. A lot of people say, hey, I'll just stick it in the soil. Well, hey, go ahead, fine, have it, you do it. I won't do it with my expensive plants. I'll do it with the noid. What is a noid? No, 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 say, no ID. No ID, no identification, no ID. And in the world of plumeria, I am no longer a no ID person. I have to have everything named because eventually I'm gonna cut my trees. If you pass by my house in River Ridge, you will see from the very start of the driveway to the rear, to the pool, to the backpack, to the backpack back, I have plumeria everywhere. And they are flowering. It is a gorgeous sight, and you can stop by in the car if I'm not home. And you can sit there and try to identify some of the smells because you've smelled them all before, or some of them you have. Now, going back to the the, um, the cinnamon, you say you put that on the plant that you cut? Like the bottom the part, meaning the stem that's left behind uh -huh. in the rooted soil. Okay. You put it on that. On the top part, you put in hominin or a, or a rooting compound. I've only found that you can get this online. I haven't found a store, or I should take that back. There are some supply houses that I deal with locally that have it. But it's hard to find. So this root stem that's left, is good for several different things. Well, if this was a noid, and I was taking a slow-growing plumeria stem, and I wanted to graft it, I would go ahead and graft it onto a noid that is fast-growing to a slow-growing stem. I would make a V cut, a V in the bottom, I would make the reverse, I call it an arrow, and the top, same size. No rooting hormone, it has to be done as soon as you make the V cut, and as soon as you make the arrow cut. You join them together, 
you find some type of graphing tape that's hard to find, but graphing tape, it's available everywhere. <coughs> and you go ahead and wrap it around, and you set that plant aside, and you let it rest, and you let it sit out of the sun, out of the rain, out of the water, until you start seeing what? Sprouts. Leaves. Y'all said it both. Sprouts and leaves. You want leaves to start falling out. I mean, not falling out. Starting to show. So as soon as they start to show, you know that your roots, I call them micro roots. But in this case, we have a root system. We don't have to worry about micro roots. So we know that plant wants to live. Plumeria want to live. I don't know if y'all have many plumeria. I've never found easy ways to kill them. They want to live. They want to survive. They want to keep going on. Send them to my house. <laughs> well, so you need to come to my house and you need to come actually see some of the things in action that I do that I may have. I should. All right, so that's one thing about propagation. The next part is, is we have bees. We have wasps. We have something that's called hum not hummingbirds, dang it. Thank you for calling. I appreciate the call. <laughs> We shall turn this off. I, I'm actually running the volunteers for the garden show this weekend. I organize a lot of things under the ag agent, so that's my home's always busy. And they wanted me to talk. I can't believe why I don't know why. <laughs> so another way of propagation is so we learned that we can actually graft these readily and easily. Now the next thing is I make a stem cut. It has now callus for 10 days. So what am I going to do with it? That was a good answer. So I'm going to find a pot, and I'm going to use a cactus-type soil. You can make cactus soil yourself. You can use um, the fines of pine bark, meaning the smallest parts of pine bark, using some type of uh, peat moss, and then using a Good mixture of perlite, about 25% perlite. And then you will take that cutting after 10 days. I usually use my thumb because it's pretty pretty accurate. I know that this is about three inches. Stick it into the pot to center, kind of compact that soil, take my cutting, put it in. I take some kind of bamboo to support it, and I put it away. And I call it in, in the happy place, which is the shade area without rain, without so, with any water whatsoever. Again, why am I doing that? I'm waiting for the leaves to develop. That's going to tell me that my roots, my micro roots, have set in place, and they are ready to really become full mature plants. So I do buy a lot of stems from all over the world. So I bring them in, and I root them, and I usually have quite a few hundred rooting, and I have quite a few hundred leaving at the same time. So it's always an ongoing process, and people say, hey, I have never been able to root a plumeria. Well, you follow basic instructions, no rain, no water, rooting hormone, cactus soil, three inches in the soil, no deeper, holding it up in place. So those are the things you do with a uh, yes, ma'am. So you're planting it in dry soil? You know, that's a great question because there is an argument about this all the way from California all the way to Florida because we have plumeric growers from Florida all the way to California. But you don't have them up north because the temperatures are a little bit get a little too cold, but they do grow. So the answer to that question is, what was the question again? <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. So slightly moistened soil is the way to go. Slightly moistened, that means not even damp, that means just slightly moistened. Leave them alone. Now, after you start seeing just a peekaboo of a leaf, you can give them a little, little dappling of water, not very much, just a slight amount, just to kind of keep that soil a little moist at the top. So then you're on your way to your plants. So we are going to have a seed giveaway today, okay? So you will walk away from some seeds. So what the plumeria do? Now I guess I'll stand up, I've been lazy. So we call these right here, do y'all know what these call these right here? Bloom spike? Bloom, what else? Bloom spike? No, 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 come on, come on, come on. Okay, I'll give up. It's called, in our world, it's called inflow. Oh, no. Oh, wow. 
What is that short for? Inflorescence. You know, I had to learn this in math and arts class. I never knew it all the years I grew plants. So they grow these inflows and they flower up. And when you smell, yeah. mm, mm -hmm. yes, it smells. So what will happen is you have different pollinators come along. They love these flowers. You can see hummingbirds landing on the flowers. They don't like the pollinators. They like the clutches. They like reds. So they come to the reds. What happens is these little guys, as several pollinators, sphinx moths are one of the biggest pollinators I found. If you have porter weed in your yard, you will have a lot of sphinx moths right now. They resemble hummingbirds. So you look at it, whoa, is that a hummingbird? No, it's not a hummingbird. The hummingbirds are already, are already going to sleep in Mexico already, or southern, because they've already, pretty much the ones that travel have gone across the Gulf already. We only have them here twice a year, hummingbirds. So it's hard to get pollination out of hummingbirds, but everything else does the whole job. I did not believe brain, blend, brain, a seed pod. They form real small. They almost look like hot dogs, and they continue two at a time from a vile flower spike. And they go out up to 10 inches, 12, 14 inches. Now here's the bad part. You think, oh God, I got seeds. Hell yeah, I'm ready. You don't. You have nine months to watch that seed pod. Sometimes seven months. So it's already happened early spring, and we're still to get more seed pods. So you kind of got to know, hey, I got seed pods this month, or that month, or this month, or that month, so that you know when to watch that seed pod. It will turn, it is usually green or this olive color, which is crazy. But as they turn brown, you know they get close to opening. So the funny thing about a seed pod is when they open, so what happens as they open, and the wind gets a hold of them, so they fall to the ground and you don't find them because the wind takes them everywhere. So if you want to try to have seeds, you've got to watch them. So what do we do? We use stockings. We use uh, these finger things, these uh, cloth um, cotton wraps, and we wrap the seed pods. So when they open, we contain the seeds if we want them. I don't want any seeds. Why? Because I am cross-pollinating from this plant to this plant. So the genetics change. There's no way to have the exact plant. They don't like to pollinate themselves. They're not self-pollinating. They pollinate crossing. So what happens to the flower? It becomes a whole new flower on the mother plant. Not on the father plant. We never know who that guy is. He's just <laughs> running around out there. And he's one of many. And we get mixed plants at that point. So when you have a seed pod, guess what happens? You're going to grow these seeds, even though they have a name on them right now. It came from my mother. I know who mother, the mothers are. I love the mothers. I watch them. But three years you have to grow. Now, that's before you see the first flower. Here's the sad thing. It could be up to seven years. So you don't know what you're going to grow. But you're going to have a pretty familiar plant. Hey. I got annoyed. I suggest you have names, but hey, start off with annoyed. You won't go wrong. Now, since we've talked about that, talked about seeds, talked about propagation, there's a couple of things that we need to do in the familiar world. We need to feed our plants three times a year. Don't need to feed more than that. Early spring, June 1st, August 1st. Three times, boom, 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 boom. All you gotta do is walk the calendar, put it in your phone, you have a load of a little ring up saying fertilize. And we use something called plumeria crack. Plumeria crack, it's a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> but a lady that I'm very good friends with, again, Karen Galat, she was in the research industry, she had chemist friends. They formulated a way to fertilize plumeria. There are fertilizers all over the United States that say this, claim that, claim this, claim that. Well, guess what? I've used them all. 
I found that since I used mammary crack, people say, well, why do you have flowers all the time? Why are your plants getting so big? Why are you so green? Why do you have leaves in it? What is that? I don't know. Maybe almost three feet. And I mean unusual, because you can see this lady's plant right here, small, the leaves. My samples are small. But you will have the tropical appearance in your yard immediately by feeding on most. So if you want a strong plant, you've got to go ahead and fertilize with plumeria crack. She sells it, the cheapest bag, I think it's five, ten, and I'm not trying to do a promotion. I'm trying to tell you what works. I also feed side feed because I want bigger and better and I want more growth. Oh wait, growth, damn, I forgot to talk about that. Growth happens on different plants at different stages, but most plumeria grow approximately. 10 inches to three feet a year. So that's a lot. So what happens? The husband has to deal with the plant going in every year, it has to go in, because we do need to protect them out of the reasons. So only when it gets below 40 degrees, the alarm goes off for me, I wait till about 36. But you've got to get those plants inside out of the freeze, but you can bring them right back out. Or you tell them good night, have a good rest. It's time for you to go to sleep. Put them away, put them up in a closet, a garage, a utility room, a bedroom, whatever you don't have in use. It can be dark, light, and different. If you put it in, most of the leaves will drop off. It will go dormant. It takes a nap. Yes, ma'am. Could you just describe your house and river ridge are always in pots? Mine? Uh -huh. Every pot. I have over 300 and something in pot right now. Uh -huh. They're all in pot. I don't put anything in the ground. Why? Because number one, I'm getting old and I'm getting hungry. And I hate to dig unless I have to dig. I dig for vegetables. I don't dig anymore from North America. I do put one or two trees in the ground per year. And the only reason why is to see what the hell's going to happen with them because they will get huge. Here in our climate, they will get huge. We're in a semi tropical environment. So we have a lot of rain, a lot of heat, a lot of development. So you want to go ahead and if you can, you want to put a plant in the ground. But it's going to get big and it's going to put a lot of flowers on. It's going to put a show like you've never seen before. But again, what do you have to do? You've got to dig that damn thing up. Excuse me, I didn't mean to say damn thing. You've got to put that darn thing up <laughs> and put it inside. You've got to take the roots, shake them off, wash them off. You can keep the roots and take it intact or you can cut some of the roots off. It's not going to happen. That's if there's an impending freeze? Yes. Sorry, total novice over here. So I'm, 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 I'm not asking questions. questions, no. But you know what? If it is going to freeze and it's in the ground, guess what? Take some cuttings off the dang thing yep. and save the cuttings. And they will rest over until next spring. They will go dormant also. You just put it in the Ziploc bag? No. No, what? Just That's going to be bold, mildew, okay. and killer instincts. I have a lot of malarious, but I've never, never. always oh. went in them. You know, he always put them in them. Spot. We we do everything we can to protect them, but the best thing is, is when you do protect them, nothing to cover it, nothing. Now some people ship me cuttings with liquid hormone on it, and they cover it with a little piece of cellophane and a tape. That's I don't like it. I don't like coming in like that because by the time they come two or three to five days, they already got mildew on. So boom, got to so recut it. Just leave them in a container out in the air. Right, or you just take them out the ground. So that's one of the things you want to do always. Mine are huge. There's no way we can take them out. So what you do now, guess what? You have friends? Yeah, no, well, they like all know. Like a few they friends. all know. You have a few friends, huh? <laughs> yes. So you know what you do is you make some cuttings. We do. And you give them away. We do. And you take the new cuttings, and that's your new trees. And you take that stalk or that stem or that big pot, and you give it to this lady here <laughs> who wants to grow it. And you say, here, or you say, $10, take it off my hands. Facebook, you can sell all day long. So get rid of the big stuff. Go back to the originals, because it's a lot easier to maintain. I'm not, I'm getting too old to do this. There's nobody to pass this on to? Who's going to, what's going to happen in the future? I have no idea, but. You can put me on your phone. I'm probably older than you, though. If you do, if you do freezing, come to my house. Okay? I'll start cutting the dang things down. I got to cut it right now. So I'm cutting for next year already in the next few weeks. I have one more show to do this year, and I'm finished. So everything I'm doing is going to be going away for winter. Not yet. we got two more months at least. Yeah. 
Why did you say, what's about phrase, you remember? I have no idea. I can't remember. December, January. Last year, it was November, we had a cold spell come through, but it didn't last. So we were looking at those one now. So the thing about plumeria, like I said, there are so many simple answers to your questions. If you like growing these plants, and if you're on Facebook, I'm Louisiana Plumeria Society. I'm an administrator on Louisiana Plumeria Society. I train, teach, go to different classes. I go throughout the state and tell the same story I'm telling you right now. People like to answer questions, I like to talk. I'm a talker. Um, one thing I want to say though, again, freeze time, cut them up, store them, store the big plants. They will go inside with flowers on them. And guess what? Don't worry about the flowers, leave them alone, because they will continue again in the spring. So you won't lose the uh, inflow, inflorescence, it will continue on. Now here is the goofiest question, okay? Uh -oh. I need the city and the place. And this is the quiz. And you get this answer correct, you will get this plant right here. And this is a Jean Morgani. She is a special plant that was named after the Morgani family. She looks a little weird right now. But I'm not giving my most expensive one away from this place. <laughs> I'm giving an expensive one away anyway. So give me the city and give me the place that we know where Plumeria originated. And I'll tell you the other answers if y'all can give me this. <laughs> Say it's this, it's not far away. Huh? Miami, Florida, Florida, Florida. I'm gonna end this right now. Cuba. With, it's Houston. not in the United States. Cuba, Cuba. Texas. Nope, nope. Jamaica. 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 I said it first. What did you say? say? Jamaica. Jamaica. Okay. Jamaica. Cuba. 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 Yeah. Because we talk about South America, we talk about Mexico, but we talk about going back several hundred years, so 800, 700 years in architectural, I don't know, what is that called? When you dig and so forth. Archaeology. So they have found flowers on some of the whole Mayan stuff and further back, and it's a flower with five petals. And it's not colored. So they claim it was a white flower, but how the hell do I know that? I'm, just, I'm researching. And I mean, I've looked my phone up and I've looked and researched and asked and went to the Mary Society of America. I tried to find an exact answer. I don't think we'll ever find an answer. But it all originated here and went out everywhere. So then we started cross pollinating on all the islands, all the islands. Everywhere where there's a tropical environment, these plants will thrive and become huge. They were used outside of Buddhist temples. They were out outside of other temples because of the fragrance, the aromas that these flowers put out. It was usually white with a yellow center. Originally from Afghanistan, it was white, white. So now, we go all over the world, we start cross-pollinating. Daddy, we don't know again. Daddy's somewhere out there on the street. <laughs> Trying to find his girl, and he finds his girl, and the next thing we know is we got a new plant. And they siege, what do they do? Tell me about the siege again. Fly away. Fly away. So then they start growing everywhere, every nook, every cranny, everywhere, everywhere they can grow. So that's the last part of my little lecture. Now, Lily, got a chair. See this plant right here? It's got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five stems, six, seven stems, eight stems of cotton right now. Wow. I'm cutting all of this over here because I've seen you grow. So this was a stem cutting off of a tree. Now, what happened? If you look in the center, you'll see this weird little scary looking little thing. 
that's where the inflow was originally. So anytime they have an inflow and they grow flowers out of it, what happens? You can get one new stem. I've seen as much as eight new stems. And so what happens to the plant? That plant is a single stem usually. As a flower, it divides. Eight stems divide, can you imagine? Those have inflows, and all of a sudden you have a, what do you call it, like an octopus almost? No, yeah. it's beyond octopus. So you see some of my trees, you'll see them with all kinds of stems all the way around. You'll also see all kinds of bobos where I've cut them. Because I like to keep making those over and over and over again. So let me just open this up now. One more thing I should, should mention. Y'all use super dry? No, no, no. Y'all use Epsom salt? Okay. Let me tell you something. A lot of people don't even know what this is. What is this, 1948? 46, something like that? World's Fair that year, they came out with this stuff. It is one of the greatest micronutrients that's on the market and vitamins. Tea, uh, teaspoon to a gallon of water, a tablespoon of Epsom salt to a gallon of water. You water these plants, or most of your tropicals once a month like this, you're giving them a lot of things to really be green because the Epsom salt is going to force the greenness of the leaf or the chlorophyll to really produce and become really green, dark green usually, not light green. And also, this is going to help your plant to thrive. You need a Maria crap. I can't tell you what's in it. I know it's about 334, so nitrogen, phosphorus, acid. So high, I mean low, high, low. And I do a lot of my uh, adenums or desert roses with the same formulation. This stuff is a miracle. Look it up. This is super broad. Y'all can come walk up here right now. I'm, I'm actually finished with the lecture, but I will give y'all seeds. Y'all can take a couple of few seeds each. I'll show you how to plant them up here.